Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we have got a great show on today because we know there are a lot of people who have bereaved kids and they're worried about raising their kids. And we've got a great guy on. He's an Open to Hope author. He's written some great articles for us. And he's going to talk to us about raising bereaved kids. Do you want to introduce him, Heidi? Sure. Uh, We're going to talk today with Richard Ballow, who is, like you said, was a widower, and he lost his wife to cancer years ago and had had young children at the time. He has since remarried. Uh, He kept a journal mom, which became an award-winning book called Life Without Lisa. Mm -hmm. He is an Open to Hope author, and he is a certified parent educator with the International Children and Parent Network. So welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you very much, Heidi. Pleasure to be here. I love the fact um, that you decided to be a stay-at-home parent, mm-hmm. and uh, and you became an educator with the International Children and Parents Network. That helped you to deal with these two young boys you had, right? Uh, that's correct, because I knew I needed more skills in parenting than what I knew. I mean, I can always have fun with little ones, mm-hmm. but as they would grow older, their questions and antics would be different, so I decided to not only you know recover from grief with hospice help but i decided to take a course on redirecting children's behavior so i could help my children and minimize their trauma as they grew older you have two boys and how old were they when lisa died when their mother died uh they were six and a half and five wow yeah very young that that's a that's a lot and so then you were on your own as a single parent at that point, raising these two young boys, and you were grieving as, as well as they were grieving. That's correct. And I was trying to minimize their grief as much as possible, but there's only so much I can do when I'm grieving. So right. luckily I had some help. Yeah. So you, Lisa, was sick for how long with cancer? It was about three and a half years. Wow. They originally diagnosed her and gave her six months. Mm. But it was a miracle she lasted that long and gave us more time, for me and the kids anyways, to be together to sort of mel as a team. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So you kept a journal about it. How how did you get the idea of journaling? Did you uh, have a therapist or somebody that helped you, gave you that idea? Or you were a writer though anyway, right? Correct. I've been writing since I was, you know, 14 years of age, and I've always journaled what I was going through to help help myself, really, to understand what I'm going through so that I can read it and say, okay, I shouldn't be doing this or that, or I need to correct something. So journaling my grief just became a natural extension of my grief work. Mm-hmm. So, and I imagine... Uh, taking these classes on raising your kids, you were probably journaling about that too, right? I was because it was worthwhile knowing what worked and what didn't and how my children responded to it. I think one of the most important things is giving my children time, giving them my time. Mm -hmm. So I would be there in the morning with them before they left for school. And when they came back, I was still there. So I was able to work my work schedule around them so that I could be with them to answer their questions and reassure them that I was not going anyplace. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the biggest dilemmas we get into as parents, especially as widowers and widows, is reassuring our kids we're not going to die, we're not going to leave them. Even as we progress and even get into dating and marriage, to reassure them that we're a team. Mm-hmm. My kids and I, we're a team. That I wasn't going to marry somebody who wasn't going to like them or accept them. Mm -hmm. So you didn't get married till 20 years after, though, right? That's correct. Uh, (laughs) So did you date in between, and how did that go for the boys? Well, I did date in between, but I seldom brought women home. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I didn't introduce them to women because I didn't want them getting attached to people that may may leave. Mm -hmm. so, that makes sense, given that they had, had lost their mother. I mean, their mother had died. That right. makes sense that you were very cautious about having other women come in that might not be in your life forever. Right, and that was the case because as I was working through my issues of grief, I would only date women for maybe six months, mm -hmm. and then I would be by myself again, sort of processing what happened. Mm -hmm. And my kids picked up on that too. So when I started to date my current wife, my son Nick said to her after we got married, he said, you know, I was sort of standoffish for the first six months because dad has this pattern. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even though you didn't bring them home, they knew. They knew, yeah. <laughs> well, your boys were, what, in their 20s when you uh, finally got married again? Yeah, they were in their late 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, my oldest son, coming up on six years of marriage, so my oldest son was 28, and my younger one was 26. Mm -hmm. And they were on their own at this point. Right. But they, were, they really liked Terry. She accepted them. And so much so that when her daughter decided to get married only three years ago, she asked my son, Nick, if he would perform the ceremony. Oh, my gosh. I love this story. So we <laughs> just get along. We all have the same sense of humor and intellect, and uh, yeah, we have a good time together. Tell me, what do you think the biggest challenges are for a guy uh, single parenting? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest challenges is having patience, mm -hmm. realizing that we can't fly off the handle and that we don't have anybody to bounce off it. Our spouse is not there anymore, and it's all on our shoulders. So we have to have the patience to deal with their questions and talk to them honestly about situations that are happening. Because kids, they're going to ask very direct questions. And we really have to know how to handle that. I think that was one of the biggest things is accepting that it's only us answering to them and to be honest and patient. Did you have family members or certain people? People that came in and helped you? I did have some help. The first year, I had an au pair from France. Mm -hmm. She arrived just before my wife passed away. You know, I gave her the option of going home if she didn't want to stay around, but she was, I can't thank her enough. She kept us on an even keel that first year. That's and after that, my sister moved down to Florida. So she was always there to help out too. So she was always, she lived right next door for many years too. So Mm. That was to help the boys could visit her, they could stay with her. And as they get older, I even hired an older woman to help take them to ball games and everything else because I seriously could not split myself in two at that point. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think it's so important to say how you brought people in to help support you and get through this because, you know, you can't do it alone. It's a, it's a, tough, a tough road. Right, especially when they were like, just teenagers, and they were getting into Little League and playing baseball, they would have games on the same night, the same wow. time, on opposite ends of the city. Wow. I had to have somebody just help me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Patty was really wonderful. She was about my age. We would switch off which kids we took. Oh, I love so that. that. They always had a woman present in their life. Mm -hmm. And even my mother would help them, too. She'd come down. Yeah. I love that. Now... What are some of the things that you've done to help help them deal with their mother's death and remember her? And well, the first trigger days were Mother's Day, and her birthday. We we brought out a cake. We had cake. We spread rose petals in the ocean, and for the first couple of years, we always remembered her with something special. Even if it was just a candle in the room that was lit. I would always tell them stories about when they were born and what their mom and I were doing so that they knew their mom was special to them. You know, bring out the pictures and reminisce. Get all those good memories reinforced in their life. Because at their age, they were going to tend to forget more because they were young. But if I had pictures and I could talk to them and say, you know, this is what we were hoping for. This is what we were thinking. This is some of the things that were funny that happened in our lives as we were growing up and as you were growing up too and your mom was here. Wow, I love that. 
I, what was the most difficult question that one of your kids asked you? Well, I'm not sure if it was difficult or heartbreaking. I, I took our kids to the airport to because my mother, I think, was coming down. And I asked a young lady next to me, you know, if this was the flight from Boston. And then Nick tugged on my shoulder and said, is that going to be our new mom? <laughs> it just broke my heart. They wanted their uh-huh. life back, too. Right. And such a reminder that they were grieving. Mm-hmm. But I think the hardest questions came when they started to date and they get older. Dating questions and the questions about sex and things like that. I'm sort of a bit of reserved with that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, my current wife, she's like, oh, yeah, she would have told him straight out because she told her daughter straight out <laughs> what it was. <laughs> well, that's, that was my question, too. What roles did Lisa fill and what roles were gone when she left? So it sounds like one of them was just candid talk about what girls like and girls in general and dating and those kind of things. Were there other things? that Was there a, other voids that you noticed when she was gone? I think it was basically that feminine touch that a, that a woman brings into the life. Yeah. Well, because to us, we had a bachelor pad. Mm-hmm. It was our house in Florida. Lisa never lived there. Mm-hmm. And it was just the three of us. We could decorate the way we wanted. You know, the huge big screen TV you could see from space. From the spring <laughs> yeah. All, the, all their friends who came over. And it's just, yeah, let's have kids around. Mm-hmm. And I think they missed having their mother around to get her perspective on things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you think they worried about you at all? They did want to see me be happy again. And that was one of their concerns. And so as I dated and they didn't see me being with anyone longer than six months, they started to worry. Mm-hmm. But as they were dating, they realized how hard dating was. Mm-hmm. But they're really happy now that I did find somebody. She's a lot of fun. And she treats them as her own. And she's very honest with them about life. Mm-hmm. And we just enjoy all of us getting together. Her daughter, my kids, our son-in-law, my wife, my oldest son's wife, all their kids. They just enjoy having us around. We sort of don't remember our grandparents being as playful as we are with our grandkids. That's fun. Well, I love that that playful and, and fun thing you're talking about. Now, tell us, how do you get your books, uh, Life Without Lisa? You can get them on my website, richardballow.com. They're at the publisher's website, which is Tolman Main Press. Or you can order them through Barnes & Nobles or Amazon. Great. And you've got a new book. You want to show us that? Yep. This will be in color when it's printed. It's... Grief, 50 Questions and Answers. Give us one of the questions and answers from that. Uh, Well, it goes by topic. So one is about dreams. It's like, why do I dream of the dead? Or dating. Do I have to date again? Okay. Or grief attacks. What is a grief attack? Or how long does grieving take? These are questions I not only ask myself, but other people have asked me through the years when I speak in public or take questions online. And I thought it'd be good to, I see the same questions coming up again and again. And I think, well, well, let me put a book together so that people can have a ready and valuable resource and go to that when they need it. Awesome. Well, and give us your website. It's richardballow.com. All right. And you can also find some of his articles in, on our Open to Hope site. And we appreciate you writing for us, Richard, and congratulations on your new book and and all that you're doing in life, and you're an inspiration. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. I try to help people and let them learn from what I've gone through. And I'm sure they do, Richard. I agree with my mom. You're an inspiration, and thank you so much for helping people out there navigate the waters of how to raise bereaved children. And thank you for having me on. I appreciate answering the questions and hopefully helping others out there. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that we hope you'll visit us at Open to Hope. And if you've had lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own. And God bless. 
I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.